1979, a cab driver was driving right in front of Piccadilly Gardens. On the left side was the Woolworth Building. It's a six-story building. There were approximately 500 people in the building at the time. And in this building, people were shopping. They were hanging out. They were doing all the things that you expect people do. Adults, children, senior citizens, all were in the building. And as the cab driver was driving down the street, he noticed smoke coming up from the building. So he pulled over to a payphone, because that's the way it worked in 1979, and he called the fire folks. And the fire folks said, yes, we've already had six phone calls about the smoke and the fire at the Woolworth building. We should have trucks over there in the next couple minutes. And so he took off, and as we understand it, the trucks got there, and they started evacuating the building. Now, in those days, we didn't have the kind of technology that we have today. In fact, many of the technologies that we have today related to fire suppression come from the Woolworth building fire, right? Because in those days, we didn't have uh, sprinklers on the ceilings, right? Um, there, was, there was no, like, you know, the signage that tells you exactly how to evacuate or what happens when the elevators get stopped. A lot of stuff came out of that. Um, but what's really interesting is that 10 people died. 40, 40 to 50 people um, were actually sent to the hospital, but 10 people died. And you go, that doesn't sound interesting, Chris. What kind of morning are you having? You go, oh, no, 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 hold on. Let me explain. Because what's crazy is it's a six-story building, and the firemen were able to get people from the sixth story and evacuate them. They were able to get people out of the fifth story and evacuate them. And the fourth and the third. People on the ground floor got out with no problem. These 10, they're on the second floor. All 10 on the second floor in the restaurant. And you go, well, what's going on? If you read and research the dynamics of the Woolworth fire, what you discover is that people will say, well, the problem, the reason these people died was because there wasn't fire suppression sprinklers. Or there was actual metal bars over some of the windows on the higher floors. And so people will say, the reason they couldn't escape, right, was because there were metal bars over windows, and that's a no-no. Like, you need a way for people to jump out. But if you're on the sixth floor and you jump out of a window, I'm going to suggest that maybe that's not your first strategy. <laughs> but the 10 people that died... We're on the second floor. It was not an issue of sprinklers. It was not an issue of windows or bars. It wasn't an issue of evacuation. Some people said, well, the fire, the fire department didn't get there fast enough. Well, they got there fast enough for the sixth story and fifth story and fourth story people to get out. So what was it that was so special about the second story in the restaurant that caused these 10 people to go? We'll come back to that in a second. How many of you, is this your first word camp? Wow, that is awesome. If this is your first WordCamp, or if, how many of you are just relatively new to the WordPress thing? Yeah, a lot of you. So, so what I want to tell you is it's really easy to get intimidated, right? It's really easy to, to discover, right, that you don't know a whole lot in this space, right? like you may know in other places, right? Um, it's a tech conference. If you're not super technical, you might get uh, intimidated. It is a community of people, many of whom know each other, and so you might feel uh, a little like, I'm the only guy here who doesn't know someone. I'm the only woman here who's not hanging out with friends. My very first WordCamp, I went to a WordCamp in Orange County. I come from California, and in Southern California, I went to this WordCamp, and it was my first that I... I should back up. I, w I went to two as a spy. I just went to look. But the first one that I participated in, I registered and everything else, I went as a speaker. And so I, I got up and I spoke, and I've been speaking for 30 years. So that was not worrisome, right? For some of you, speaking in public is like worse than death. I didn't have a problem. Lunchtime was my problem because I didn't know anyone, right? So what happened? I sat alone eating the little sandwich that they gave us right? And uh, 
And, and there was a, there's a woman in Orange County who says, I remember you. I remember you because you looked so sad. <laughs> and I was like, I had a sad look on my face. She goes, no, no, no. Your situation looked so sad. <laughs> oh, well, well, thank you very much. I'm, I can't help that I didn't know anyone, right? It's easy to get intimidated because you don't know people or you don't know stuff. You go into a session, right? And they're talking and it clearly the, the topic just went past you. And so you start feeling a little bit insecure, a little stressed, right? And what I want to tell you this morning is, hey, all of that is normal. You're in a new place, a new community, new code, new everything else. It's easy to get intimidated. What I want to do this morning is tell you seven stories that all have one point. So here's the challenge. When you go to a whole, enter into a community, when you enter into a group of people, you're going to discover that there are people in that room that are smarter than you. And that doesn't always feel good. I was born three months premature. And uh, in 1970, if you were born three months premature, you had a 50-50% chance of surviving. You had a 95% chance of being brain damaged. My wife says, just imagine how smart you'd be if you'd gone full term. <laughs> it turned out I was lucky because I was born in Tucson, Arizona, and they had uh, a, a medical center there connected to the university that had an incubator. So they could put me in this little, you know, easy bake oven and keep me going for a while. I survived, right? But the doctors told my parents, if you want a normal child, get pregnant right away. So my younger brother is 15 months younger than me. Like they were serious about this, right? My parents were like, we need to have another child. And it turns out he's quite smart. And so uh, I grew up in schools where my brother and I would be in the same math class. Right? Now, I don't know if you understand the order of things, but the older kid's supposed to be smarter than the younger kid, right? In TV, if you watch Leave It to Beaver, right? Beaver goes into a classroom and the parents are like, or the teacher is like, I had your brother, right? And you're like, oh, my brother, he did so much better than me and now I have, the older one's supposed to be smarter. <laughs> no one told my brother that. <laughs> and so uh, I grew up with a brother who was, at least in math, right, smarter than me. At dinner time, right, my family at dinner time, my dad would do stupid things like, what's the square root of 732? To which, if some of you are trying to work that out, this was my mental process followed by my verbal process. I said, 17, 27, 32, am I getting close? <laughs> that was it. Like, this was not a fun exercise for me. Like, the square root of numbers is not what I do on the weekend. It's not even what I do during the day. I'm like, this is not, I don't, my brother, my brother would give my dad a number to a decimal point, and my dad would be like, yeah, that's really close. I was like, what's wrong with you? When my parents weren't looking, I'd beat the crap out of him, right? Because that's something an older brother can do, right? <laughs> I would fake like I'm on the phone. In those days, we had a physical phone with a cable that went to a, you know, an outlet. And so, you, so I would hold it up, and he would think, well, if you're chained to that phone, there's no way you can catch me. And he'd come into my room. I was, not ta I was fake talking. What's going on, baby? How you doing? Yeah, no, I love you too. The moment he got in, dropped the phone, chased him, pound him on his own bed, right? Just bam, 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 right? Because I was not smarter than my brother. And it turned out my parents knew it, and my parents said it too all the time. My dad would say, Chris is a hard worker. Jose, he's a smart one. I grew up in this dynamic. And then I got married and we had a child, and my child has the IQ of Einstein. She's smarter than me and my wife combined, right? And I'm like, oh. Good news, I've spent a lifetime learning how to work with people smarter than me. I manage a whole bunch of software engineers, every single one of them smarter than me, right? So when I stepped in the WordPress community, having people smarter than me around, not a problem. I'm used to, oh my God, if there's one card I know how to play, it's how to hang out with people smarter than me. But it's, it's a place where you can feel intimidated. It's a place where you can feel stressed. It's a place where you can start the negative self-talk that talks you out of trying things or doing things because there's people that are smarter than you. In any community that you hang out with, there's going to be people that are smarter than you. There's also going to be people who are disappointed in you, right? How many of you think disappointed should be removed from anyone's vocabulary in personal language because when someone says to you, um, I'm disappointed in you, 
it's like they're stabbing you. Anybody else, or is it just me? The rest of you are liars. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is not fun when someone looks at you and says, well, I'm, I'm disappointed in you. And you're like, well, what did I do, right? My dad was an engineer. My dad came from South America. He came to the U.S., right? He came to the U.S. as a young man to go to the university, and he got an undergrad degree, right? Even though he was a foreigner and only spoke Spanish and he learned English, and he got a bachelor's degree in engineering, and then he went to another university, uh, moved, again, thousands of miles away from home, so he could go to a second university to get a master's degree, and then he worked on his PhD. While he then went, when I was in school, he went back to get another master's degree. When I graduated high school, my dad graduated with his second master's degree, and he looked at me and he said, son, there are a lot of kids who go to college and they say, Dad, college is harder these days. But I just finished college, again, a master's degree with straight A's, while I was a parent, while I was a coach, while I was an employee. So don't give me any, any mess. I fully expect you to get straight A's. <laughs> How do you explain, I had no intention of getting a single A at college? <laughs> That just wasn't on the objective list, right? I'm like, so after, I don't know, six months, I got into a very prestigious program at UC Berkeley that was bioengineering, which there's only one student that year that they accepted in the program. That was me. I was the guy. I was special. I got this special. And after six months, I quit the program. And the dean was so pissed that he made me sign a document that kicked me out of the entire College of Engineering, which I did in about two femtoseconds, right? Which means it's really, really short time. I, just, I was like, okay, I'm out. No, no problem. And then I came home and explained to my dad that uh, I wasn't going to be a software engineer. And he's like, I'm, I'm disappointed in you. And uh, I said, yeah, but it's going to be a lot easier to get A's in college letters and science than it was in <laughs> engineering. So we had that I still didn't get a straight A GPA, right? I was just, that's not me. That wasn't who I was. But there are people in any community that are going to be disappointed in you right, that are going to have expectations of what you should do or what you could do, and you are not going to hit it, right? And you're going to go, ah, should this change how I act? Should this change how I behave? Should I do? Now, let's be clear. Certain expectations are good. Nobody sitting next to you right now expects you to fart, right? <laughs> certain expectations are good. But most of the expectations people put on you, especially if you're a stranger, if they don't actually know you, if you haven't hung out and vacation together, they just kind of know your name from some realm of something. They're like, well, I expected this of you. And you're like, who are you to put expectations on me? It's very easy to feel intimidated in the community and stressed because someone else has expectations for you. Since many of you are new to this WordPress thing, you don't know, or maybe you don't know, a guy named Pippin Williamson, right? Pippin is awesome. Pippin uh, runs a website called Pippin's Plugins. He has a very famous plugin for e-commerce called Easy Digital Downloads. He also has a uh, plugin for affiliate programs called Affiliate WP, which is another WordPress plugin. He also uh, has Restrict Content Pro, which is a membership plugin. Um, he is a prolific publisher of WordPress plugins and also tutorials to teach people how to do things. If you've not been to Pippin's Plugins and signed up as a member to get access to his uh, programs. You do not know what you're missing. Pippin is fantastic. He's amazing. He's also this kind of short, wiry, skinny dude who uh, has a very distinctive look. Like if you see Pippin, then you know that's Pippin. And so Pippin and I were hanging out on Twitter and DMing each other. And we were like, I would say we're friends, right? And then uh, we got into like a little Slack channel and we're going back and forth and yeah. I would consider Pippin a friend. Pippin knows who I am. I know Pippin. We've talked. I've, I've helped him out with problems he has in his business. He's helped me out with problems I've had with code. Like, we are friends. Until I showed up to a word camp. And Pippin walked right by me. And I was like, Pippin. And he just kept walking. I was like, that's rude. And then a couple weeks later, we were online again, and he was totally fine. And I'm like, what's up with this? Like, when we're online, it's cool, and in person, he's kind of a jerk. That's... So I go to the next WordCamp. He's there, right? 
he's walking, and this time, like the first time I thought maybe he, maybe he didn't hear me, maybe he didn't see me, but now he's walking right at me with the whole glassy look and walks right past me. I am not someone normally that you can miss. <laughs> I take up a certain amount of physical space that suggests I'm present. <laughs> so the dude just walks right by me and doesn't, and I'm like, what? So now I got all these stories running in my head of what's going on. Like, what did I do to mess with, what's going on? Get to a third word camp. And I know he's going to be there, so I'm, I'm looking for him, right? Like, we should just have this, settle this beef right now. Because if not, the WordPress community is going to get split in half. You choose Pippin or you choose Lemma, that's it. Pick sides, right? And I walk up, and there's Pippin. And standing right next to him is his twin brother. <laughs> identical twin. What the hell? <laughs> Turns out the guy that's been walking right by me is Jonathan. And I'm like, well, I should at least get to know you so that you don't ignore me when you walk by me all the time. <laughs> but in a community of folks like this, it's easy to get ignored too, right? Whether it's a twin or not, it is easy to be in a place where you're like, I thought, I thought we were cool, but like, what's going on here? I, uh, I got involved writing some code in the WordPress community a while ago. And uh, most of you, if you know me at all, you know I write a blog. You do not know me for writing code. That's because I wrote this little plugin for WooCommerce uh, to do um, crowdfunding. And I submitted it to the guys at WooThemes. This is before I was a strategic coach for them, before I helped them out. I was just a nobody, but I submitted the code. Um, but I was already writing my blog a little bit. And, um, and they wrote me back a message that said, Dude, that's how they opened. It wasn't Chris, it was dude, comma. Um, have you ever turned on debugging? Now for those of you that are non-technical, right, there is a switch you can turn on into your code and into your uh, environments where you're writing code. You can turn on a switch and it will bring your Latina mother or your, <laughs> your Jewish mother or any other nag uh, <laughs> and tell you all the things that you've been thinking about that are wrong. That's, that's what, I mean, technical people, is that what a debugger does, right? I, I, yes. When you turn on debugger, that's, it's just like, um, you didn't part your hair right, you didn't put on the right, that, that doesn't look like a clean shirt. Like, it's everything, it's everything. And so I'm like, well, why in the world would I want to turn that on? Like, the code works, at least on my computer, right? And, uh, and so since, since the WooThemes guys, you know, got this code, they decided, um, why don't we send you every mistake you've ever made? Like, here you go. Shh. Like, look at all these problems. A and uh, I was totally embarrassed, right? I was like, oh my God, like, this is horrible. Uh, and then they said, like, well, you also have to, s I was only writing for Stripe, and they're like, you also have to support, um, you also have to support PayPal. And I was like, well, I hate PayPal. So, uh, <laughs> so that was my exit, right? Well, I'm not going to write this code anymore. I'm not going to do this plugin anymore. I'm just throwing it away because you are making me use PayPal. Really, right, I'm like, because I just don't want to talk about code e ever again, right? Me and semicolons, we're not friends, okay? <laughs> so I was just like, no, 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 I don't want to do this anymore. Um, there are, in, in every group of people, right, even when they're trying to be helpful, there are people who are going to highlight your mistakes. They're going to say, no, that's not right, right? And in the open source world where you publish your code somewhere, there are people who are going to not only pick on the actual code, right, I wrote, I wrote a, a blog post about something, that a problem I'd solved, and I wrote the little bit of code that I, I had written. And I double-checked it, triple-checked it, like, because this is going to get published in an article, people are going to see it. I get anywhere from 80 to 100,000 people that visit the site every month, and so uh, people are going to see this. So I double-checked it. Some dork in England wrote back, <laughs> a friend of mine, uh, hey, Chris, Right here where you do an if, then, else, right? Like your if, you could have just put the clause you were looking for in the ifs. It would, bind it, it would automatically give you back the binary response, which would allow you to skip the rest of this code. And I'm like, are you optimizing four lines of code? <laughs> right? And so I wrote back and I said, um, does this improve performance? And he was like, well, it could shave off a couple milliseconds. <laughs> now he did all this in public, right? So I'm like, 
you're sitting here critiquing my code in public for a couple of milliseconds, right? Who are, he, I, I'm like, are you using Windows? <laughs> I know you. I know who you are, right? I'm like, stop. Don't do, but there are, and in the open source world where you publish code, if you're, if you're involved in writing anything, even when you write an article, people, would, I would write an article and I would camel case the title, right? So I would say something like, Chris Lemma speaks at WordCamp and every first word would be, or every first initial of the, the, the first letter of each word was capitalized. And someone would come back and go, that's not how you, that's not how you write. Like, you, you can't do that. <laughs> to which I gloriously wrote back and said, on chrislemma.com I can do anything I want. <laughs> Thank you very much for your opinion. Uh, those of you that are just getting used to WordPress, if you have a blog or if you're playing with a blog at all and people are coming in writing comments to you about things, right? I want to tell you one thing that most people don't ever talk about. I'm just going to highlight, throw it in right here as a nice little Easter egg for this talk. Um, you can delete comments. <laughs> It took me several years to figure that out. Once I did, it was awesome. I delete more than I save, right? Because I'm like, nope, nope, nope. Because if you come into my house, right, I'll, I'll let you come into my house. I'll let you take a drink out of my fridge. We can hang out and all that. But if you start spray painting on my walls, we're going to have issues, right? And that's what comments are on my website. There's someone who decided, I, I'm going to put an ad for my own plugin on your post. And I'm like, delete. I'm going to tell you how you're wrong. Delete. I used to think that was wrong, right? Like, no, I want open disk. Uh, no, I don't. Nope. <laughs> Turns out I have no interest in what you're saying, uh, unless it's an actual problem I can help with. But if you want to pontificate, delete, go do it on your own blog, right? There are people who are going to highlight your mistakes. And sometimes they don't even mean it as a malicious thing. They're just trying to help you. But it can feel intimidating. It can feel stressful, right? You just go, ah, I'm not up to, I'm not up to whatever imaginary bar you have in your head, right? Whatever bar you think. What's it going to take to participate and be a part of this community? And you've set a bar, and it's too high, and you're feeling stress and anxiety all the time. There are also people that are going to hustle more than you, right? I have a friend of mine. How many of you have ever been to a website called WP Beginner? Yeah, most of you, OK? So uh, my buddy runs that site. His name is Syed Balki. And uh, uh, Syed is, I'm not joking, he's 20 years younger than me. He's a good friend of mine. I really like Syed, but he's 20 years younger than me. Um, so his energy level is exponentially higher than mine. I'm very excited because he just had his first child. I'm like, ha <laughs> <laughs> Just you wait. <laughs> Your energy levels will tend. He's like, no, no, no. I still get up at 5 AM. I'm like, yeah, just give it a little time. Right? Right now, sure. right now Amanda is doing all the work, all the heavy lifting, because Solomon is so young. I'm like, wait, wait till you have to, you know, really get involved. Then you're gonna, you're gonna slow down. I'm hoping, right? <laughs> because he's 20 years younger and he works, he works longer, harder, stronger. Uh, he's just incredible, right? And and all I say is, yeah, I was that way when I was your age. I, I'm just not that age anymore, right? But he's gonna hustle more, all the time, right? And I just go, okay, well, thankfully, right? I have experience on my side, which allows me to skirt some of the areas where someone else might hustle, and I just go, I'm going to hustle a little less, hopefully a little smarter. But there are always going to be, in any community, there's going to be people who work harder, who push harder, who get up earlier. He gets up at 5 a.m. every morning. I'm like, no. <laughs> I only see 5 a.m. if I'm literally on the way to the airport for a 6 a.m. flight. That's the only way I see 5 a.m. If I see 5 a.m. any other way, it's because maybe I was out too late, right? But not, not because I got up early, right? That's just, that's not my jam. And lastly, there's people that are going to disagree with you, right? People who fundamentally don't think that your idea is a good one. They don't think that what you do is or what you're planning on doing is all that interesting. They think you're wrong, and they're going to tell you about it. In April, of, uh, about a year ago, I quit my job, right? I was uh, the um, CTO of a company called Crowd Favorite, which does professional services with WordPress for very large companies. I'd been there for about 18 months. The last 23 years, I've been a product guy who uh, builds SaaS products, right? And uh, the names have changed, right, from hosted application to uh, application service providers to SaaS, but it's all still hosted software. I've been doing that forever. I'm a product guy. And I had taken this one little stint for 18, 19 months to help my buddy out who ran a service company. And then I said, OK, um, this is awesome, but 
this company's not really going to spin up a product arm, and that's what I am about. And so let's part ways while we're still all friends and happy. And so I, I left Crowd Favorite, and I had some friends who were like, what are you doing? What do you, you don't have another job? And I'm like, no, I, I just, I, I'm going to take some time off. You can't quit your job if you don't have the next job lined up. I'm like, oh, you've been talking to my dad. I see. <laughs> Is he paying you for this, right? My dad didn't get it. My dad was stressed. I had some friends who were stressed. You can't do this. I'm like, yeah, well. Uh. My wife was like, hey, I know you're smart. What's the plan? And I'm like, well, we have a couple different revenue streams. We're going to be okay, right? I'm just going to take some time off. I took eight or nine months off. I just sat in the hot tub pretty much every day and smoked cigars, right? If you don't know, I like cigars. If you don't know, I like hot tubs. I put them together. That's what I do. <laughs> it was awesome. And so every day I would Instagram a picture of me smoking a cigar and and, uh, and I was doing nothing. And they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm thinking about what I want to do next. I finally figured it out, right? And I said, what I want to do is the WordPress world, right, is fantastic at solving certain problems. There are other problems that WordPress doesn't solve so well, right? Or at least open source doesn't solve so well. Because it's very hard to get volunteers to voluntarily solve really big problems if there's not necessarily a payout on the other end. And so we have problems. We've had, uh, WordPress has had is di little different issues for a super long time. And we just went, mm, that's just kind of the way it is. And so I was like, what I, uh, I want to do, I want to solve this problem where we can just update the plugins automatically. Well, no host is going to do that because of the liability issues. I'm like, but there's ways around that. We could solve that. And what I want to do is I want to do, uh, I want to do automatic image compression, right? So that every single image that gets loaded everywhere, right? Doesn't matter if you're using Jetpack or not. It's just automatically fine-tuned for you. Whoever was happy was not the person who was telling me, that's stupid, you're not gonna, that, you can't do that. Because <laughs> there were people disagreeing with me. I said, you know, what I really want is I want staging where someone makes an edit in staging while also someone else makes an edit in production of the same exact post or page, and we can sync them. And like, you can't do that. I'm like, yeah, you can. You can't, there's a way. Like, we could do this and this. No, no one's going to do that. So I'm talking to friends, and they're like, there's no way. There's no way. Uh, and that's, a, that's a, like, what do you get? That's, you're going to work all this time on open source code that you're going to give away, and then you're never going to make money, and you need more people. And I said, well, you know what? Um, after eight or nine months, I decided I'm going to join a hosting company. And like, you're a product guy. You don't go to a host company. I'm like, no, I'm going to go to a hosting company. Um, and so I joined a company in December called Liquid Web. And uh, when, I, when I did, um, I gave them my roadmap. Here are the things I want to solve. These are, these are serious problems, and I want to solve them. And they said, OK. And so we now have them, right? We have image compression. We have automatic PHP upgrading. We have uh, um, staging. We're getting ready to do the staging. We're getting ready to release it, right, where someone could change the categories, and someone else could change the post type in two different places and sync automatically with no UI, just automatically. And you're like, <gasps> yes. And we're, we're doing lots of fun things, but my point isn't to talk to you about Liquid Web. My point is that there's always going to be someone who tells you that's a bad idea, that's a wrong idea, that's a dumb idea, you shouldn't do it, you can't do it, you, whatever it is. There's going to be people who disagree with you in any community. And you just kind of go, OK, I, like I get it. Right? My trick, and the one I recommend to you, get involved. Get involved. Whether it's writing code or writing documentation or building a plugin or testing a plugin or, or testing a theme or writing a blog, wh whatever it is, get involved and keep showing up. Because all the intimidation in the world gets defeated by that dynamic. All the stress in the world that you might have and all the narratives that are running through your head about whether you're worthy or not all disappear in this context of showing up and being there. Right? One of my favorite quotes is by a guy named Steve Martin. You may have heard of him. <laughs> the comedian. <laughs> the actor. <laughs> Saturday Night Live. He plays a banjo. <laughs> he said, you know what? When it's your turn to be picked, right, you have to be within pointing distance. And you go, what? He said, in comedy, He's now, he's now a writer, he's now a director, he's, like, he's done all sorts of things. And he goes, I can't tell you the number of times that I'm casting, I'm writing you know, a movie, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm thinking about who's the right person. And then it's just because I see them walk by, and I go, they would be great for the movie, and then I write them in. 
his first jobs, he's like, I, I showed up, I had no talent. But you got to go to L.A. If you want to be in, or if in comedy, right, you got to be in, in Toronto or Chicago, New York or L.A. You got to go to a place where the action is. You got to go where the action is because at some point, the older people die off. That's his quote, not mine. <laughs> and when it's your time to be picked, you have to be in pointing distance. So you keep showing up. The corollary to this, right, is stop worrying about what other people are doing, right? Stop looking at it. Stop stressing at all about it. A lot of us get into this whole distracted mode and copy-paste syndrome. I don't know if you've ever thought about copy-paste syndrome, but copy-paste is great when you're talking about text on a screen. Copy it out of one doc, put it in another. But when you're trying to copy and paste someone else's life on yours, bad call. Because you don't have context. You don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. All you see is the external movement. You have no backstory. You have no context. Don't get distracted by other folks. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. In 1979, on the second story of the Woolworth building, 10 people died because they were in the restaurant. You go, why? What is it about a restaurant? Was it harder to get out of the restaurant? Was there an exit path that was blocked? What happened? Why would, why would someone not be able to exit a restaurant in the same way as any other part of the building? And here's the trick. It was 1.30 p.m. 1.30 meant... Those people were at the restaurant for lunch. Those people had eaten lunch. And those people hadn't gotten their check yet. And they looked around at the other tables and they didn't want to be the first one to skip paying for their check. They didn't want to be the first person to get up and walk out without paying the bill. And so they stayed. They looked left they looked right, they felt the peer pressure, and all it took was an extra minute to get smoke into that room, to get smoke inhalation, to ultimately die. I'm not joking around when I say comparison kills. You look left, you look right, you get distracted, you let other people decide what you can and can't do. If it doesn't kill you physically, it could kill you mentally or emotionally. Ten people did it. Ten people demonstrated the lesson in 1979 in the Woolworth fire. Right? You don't want to do it. Don't let what others are doing dictate for you what you can and can't do. I, I love my job. Every day I get up and I get to do things and I get to write checks. I hire no, people but also companies to help us build stuff. We're getting ready to do some new things. Uh, with WooCommerce, and I love writing the check, and I love getting the people to solve these really big problems because other people said, well, you can't solve that. You can't do that. You can't whatever. And I'm like, that just doesn't govern what I can and can't do. Your belief or lack of belief, your trust or lack of trust is not going to be the one that dictates what I do. And in a community like this, with so many people, and especially if you're new, it's really easy to get intimidated. And it's really easy to let someone else's beliefs or actions impact what you do. And I don't want that for you. So this morning, as you start this conference, as you step into all sorts of rooms, as you meet people, as you connect with people, as you listen to sessions, even though some of them are above your head, I just want you to know, this can be intimidating. I get that. But comparison kills. And this is your show. So just enjoy it. Engage. Keep showing up. Keep getting involved. And you will defeat that insecurity. My name's Chris Thumma. You can find me on Twitter at, at Chris Thumma. Also, I'm at Liquid Web, and I have a blog over at christhumma.com. Thank you very much.